think of East Anglia, there are the huge skies, the wind sweeping through these flat landscapes, and also the constant battle as the sometimes menacing sea tries to reclaim the land. This part of the country can seem remote and mysterious. There are isolated communities, sometimes with dark secrets. Many of our top crime writers have chosen it as the backdrop for their stories. Authors like P.D. James, Ruth Rendell and Dorothy L. Sayers have set some of their most popular work here. I'll be trying to discover why this beautiful but sometimes bleak landscape has come to inspire quite so many of our crime writers and how in turn their books have helped shape our image of this place. <laughs> That's not a real crime scene, by the way, just a bit of dramatic license. For an area which in real life has a very low crime rate, an extraordinary number of fictional corpses have washed up on these shores. Our journey spans more than 80 years and starts in the flat Fenlands of the 1930s. Crime writer Dorothy L. Sayers grew up in the tiny Fenland village of Bluntisham cum Erith. It was the remote communities and landscape around her which inspired some of her classic 1930s mysteries, including probably her best known, The Nine Tailors. I've always had a bit of a crush on Dorothy L. Sayers, suave, aristocratic detective, Lord Peter Whimsey. In The Nine Tailors, after a car accident in a ditch, he finds himself in a remote Fenland village. This is a story of an unsolved crime and its violent unravelling two decades later. Mile after mile, the flat road reeled away behind them. Here a windmill, there a solitary farmhouse, there a row of poplars strung along the edge of a reed-grown dike. And as they went, the land flattened more and more, if a flatter flatness were possible. This church in Terrington St. Clement was the inspiration for the fictional one Sayers used in The Nine Tailors. The mystery involves the theft of a valuable emerald necklace. A central part of the plot involves bell ringing. A secret message and clue to the identity of the murderer is hidden among the bells. Nearly 60 years after Sayer's death, the author has a very active appreciation society. They regularly meet and visit locations featured in her books. Why do you think The Nine Tailors has remained so popular? Well, I think it's a very well-written book. I mean, I know that sounds obvious, but I think it's, it's very well-written. Um, I think it evokes this landscape that we're in part of at the moment brilliantly, um, and that any, anybody reading it would, uh, I think, really enjoy it. It's a fascinating story as well. It's a bit different from many just ordinary murder stories. What is it, do you think, about this landscape that made Dorothy L. Sayers think it would be a great place to set a murder mystery? I think that there is a sense of landscape sometimes about desolation, of alienation, of um, sadness that maybe inspired her. I don't know. Uh, that's, that's what I think anyway. And we get a very good idea of the fens, don't we, from the very beginning of the book. Yes, yes. And, and hearing about the drive through the countryside and taking things a little too quickly for, for safety. Um, it's all those kinds of things that you feel she really knew the roads, she knew where they were going, she had an idea of the sorts of things that could happen. Um, and yet, somehow she keeps you on the edge of your seat, wanting to know well, what's going to happen next. 
I really love the way that Dorothy L. Sayers just immersed herself in this landscape and she writes in painstaking detail about how the fens themselves were created. Centuries ago, this land was drained, which means that some of it is still below sea level, as you can see right down there. And in fact, if there weren't miles and miles of flood banks and drainage pumps, an awful lot of what you see around me would be underwater. The dramatic climax of the Nine Tailors features a massive flood as the drainage system is overpowered by a storm. Just a few years after Sayers wrote the book, life would tragically mimic art. In 1953, a huge tidal surge left much of this part of the country underwater and more than 100 people died. Another thunderous crash brought down the weir across the 30 foot in a deluge of tossing timbers. Beams and barges were whirled together like straws and a great spout of water raged over the bank and flung itself across the road. The Fenland that Sayers portrays so accurately is still recognisable. Today, it's the responsibility of the Environment Agency to manage this man-made landscape. The birds and the wildflowers here are just fantastic. And it's so strange to think that this landscape was all created by mankind. 500 years ago, what would this place have looked like? Well, the area that we're in now would have probably been pretty much underwater continuously. Um, there wouldn't, we wouldn't have the banks and the wildlife that we see here today. So it'd be part of the sea? Yes, yeah, yeah. The sea would have come in quite a, quite a distance inland, um, probably to the past here. Um, and also we would have been inundated every time it rained as well. So it would have been, a, it would have been sitting in a basin continuously. The constant threat of flooding adds tension throughout the book. Sayers gives the landscape of the Fens its own personality. In its own limited, austere and almost grudging fashion, the Fen acknowledged the return of the sun. The floods withdrew from the pasture, the wheat lifted its pale green spears more sturdily from the black soil. The most successful crime novelists recognise that landscape and location are key in any successful book, perhaps more so in crime fiction than any other genre. This is the University of East Anglia, home to the world-renowned creative writing department, where the crime authors of tomorrow are learning their craft. Had, for instance, Dorothy L. Sayers not have been born in the Fens, had her father not been a rural rector, had, say, she been born in London or Edinburgh, what might have happened? And I, I, I would suspect, actually, she would have still written those sorts of um, crime novels, but with completely different settings. Oh, yeah, I think in crime it's because the setting is intrinsically linked, because it determines what the crime is, and also who's going to investigate it, whether there is a detective, or you know, whether it's a kind of a murder, or just a sort of petty theft, you know, kind of family drama. So it doesn't matter how civilised, how ordered the place is. I mean, a crime will change the setting in itself. Of all literary genres, setting, landscape, environment are the most important within the crime genre. Why? Because they determine the mood, the tone of a novel. Many writers, many critics think of setting, landscape, environment in relation to, to the genre as being another character. It is as important as that. Indeed, in many ways, it is more important than the character. It is the most determining, controlling factor within the genre. Henry Sutter not only teaches creative writing, he's also a successful crime writer himself. And, like Dorothy L. Sayers, he chooses to set his stories in the place where he grew up. Murder comes in all shapes and sizes. Over the years, I've incorporated many other areas of criminal behaviour too. 
racketeering, blackmail, extortion, fraud, arson, theft, kidnapping and so on. But there always has to be a murder or a suspicious death. My Criminal World is set in the fictional seaside town of Kingsmouth. In reality, it's based on the Norfolk holiday resort of Great Yarmouth. It's about an author who's busy writing a crime story while his own life is in crisis. It's a book within a book, and of course, there's a nasty murder or two. When you're walking around places, um, do you find you get ideas for books? Most definitely, but what I suppose really uh, spurs an idea is, is, is something visual rather than actually, you know, if I'm, if I'm sort of static looking out at something. So the spot we're in now, for instance, I came, I came upon it from the, my car, which I had parked over there, and I looked out towards the dunes and then the sea and then obviously the wind farm. Um, and one way or another, my mind, you know, I was thinking this is possibly the, the, the prettiest bit, the most sort of wild, untamed part of Great Yarmouth, these lovely dunes here. It's the, lovely the wild thick, flowers everywhere. Thick marum there. grass and so on. And I thought, well, actually, you know, what can I do with it? And it, this is an area uh, that's been designated of outstanding natural beauty. So to me, and I thought, well, the most dramatic thing I can do with that is put in right in the centre here, perhaps sort of over there, a uh, badly mutilated naked corpse. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's not what I would do when I come to an area of natural beauty. No, but that's the crime writer's no. mind. Well, isn't it? I, it, it's it's about being dramatic, I think, and it's also yeah. about about using extremes. So you have the contrast. You have the contrast, and somewhere like Great Yarmouth, I think, is a place that's absolutely full of extremes. And and you look at this place and you think, well, why why isn't it that you know one of the most extraordinary resorts in in the East Coast? What why is it so? deprived which actually it is um, and then you you move a bit closer into town and, and you get to see more and more deprivation you know why has that happened and and for me as a writer I find it absolutely fascinating this this contrast and, and in a way that's what I was or have always been actually taken with a minute or so on and Jones had cleared the dunes and was out on the pebbly beach having reached the high tide mark a thick line of drying seaweed and stonewashed plastic rubbish. There was a faint smell of rotting fish and tar. Why is it you think that East Anglia has become a kind of mecca for crime writers? Just look at the sky, uh, look at the sea. Um, it's almost hard to see where they meet, isn't it? Um, it's, it's pretty oppressive or can be. Um, it's lonely, it's isolating, it's also um, thought-provoking. It's, it's simply dramatic, I think, as a setting. And I suppose in a way it's slightly similar to the kind of landscapes that we see in Scandinavian yeah. crime programmes yeah. and read I mean, about in novels. We just, you know, just a short way across the North Sea, they are our kindred crime spirits, there's no doubt about that. This, to me, feels like Henning Mankell, it feels like, or even the bridge, the killing. It, it, there is a real uh, closeness, a kindred um, sense of crime space. Glancing up at the massive chimney of the redundant power station, clouds bunching, gulls swirling, he'd grown to like this town, like the way it was sandwiched between a wide, fast-flowing river and the sea how it was out on a limb, vulnerable, helpless, hopeless. Whether it's the coastal town or Fendon village, it's the isolation and edginess we keep coming back to. And that's something author P.D. James played with brilliantly. Her famous fictional character was the detective Adam Dalgleish. Several of his investigations took place just a short boat ride from Great Yarmouth. For most of us, this would be just a lovely day out at sea. But in the dark imagination of P.D. James, a boat like this becomes the final resting place for a corpse with its hands cut off. She loved the isolation of this place. And you can see just how precarious the coastline is, the way the sea erodes it. 
and it's almost as if the land and the sea are fused into one. It's a liminal landscape, the perfect setting for a mystery. Storms are common here, and it's not unusual for homes to be swept into the sea. This natural erosion and its impact on the lives of people who live here feature heavily in P.D. James's book, Unnatural Causes. It was hard to believe, thought Dalgleish, that one was looking at a battlefield where for nearly nine centuries that land had waged its losing fight against the sea. Hard to realize that under that deceptive calm of veined water lay the nine drowned churches of old Dunwich. Dunwich was a real place, and what's left of it lies just a few feet below this very water. 800 years ago, it was the capital of East Anglia and an international port, at its height rivaling 14th century London. But violent storms and erosion have swept it all away. Not so far from here is the area of Minsmere, which you may of course know from Spring Watch as an extremely peaceful wildlife reserve not in the imagination of P.D. James. She changed the name to Monksmere Head and a murderer's on the loose amongst the small community of writers which live there. The setting for me is tremendously important and nearly always the book begins with the setting. W.H. Auden said that it should be the great good place. He wanted contrast between the setting and the murder. He said it should shock in the same way as when a dog makes a mess on the drawing room carpet. That was the words he used. Nothing on this coast is static, and James uses this to create a sense of foreboding. Sometimes the drowned graveyards yield up bones onto the beach, a macabre idea which rather appealed to B.D. James. The closed, remote communities you get in this part of the world provided rich material for many of her books. The wild coast of Suffolk was the perfect setting. Here was nothing but sea, sky and marshland. An empty beach with little to mark the miles of outspaked shingle, but the occasional tangle of tar-splotched driftwood and the rusting spikes of old fortifications. P.D. James loved this area and had a home just a few miles away. As you might imagine, her stories are of particular interest to people who live around here. These women are all members of a local book club. <laughs> so how well do you think that P.D. James described this, this landscape, this part of the world, which you must know very well? It's um, part of the description of the atmosphere is very good, but the actual locations aren't necessarily the same. And maybe it's because um, there's a lot of erosion around here <laughs> and a lot of the cliffs have actually <laughs> fallen into the sea. So things which might have been the headland perhaps aren't the headland anymore. Why do you think it is that so many crime writers have been attracted to this part of the world? Well, I think we're lucky actually for having such a lot of variety. I mean, in just this strip of coast, we've got marshes, We've got Clifftop, Heath, we've got the Bird Reserve, we've got the forests, we've got... It, it, it's just amazing in terms of the difference. And there are lots of places where, you know, one could actually do a murder and hide somebody. <laughs> <laughs> and I like the way that the sea is giving up its secrets as well. So the, the corpse washes up in the, in the boat and then bones wash up here as yeah. well, don't they? Yeah. Well, frequently, I mean, almost, if you kept looking at this cliff and came down after another storm, it's not unknown to find, you know, an arm bone sticking out or whatever. And the lady in the museum said, oh, yes, yeah, but she had an old man who came in who said when they were boys, if they found a skull, they used it as a football, <laughs> which is absolutely horrendous. I'm beginning to understand why this is such a macabre part of the world, using <laughs> <laughs> skulls as football. Oh no, horrid, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Dalgleish loved this emptiness, this fusion of sea and sky. But today the place held no peace for him. He saw it suddenly with new eyes, a shore alien, eerie, utterly desolate.
P.D. James couldn't resist tapping into the dark underbelly beneath the sunny, idyllic veneer of the Suffolk coastline. She died in 2014. But the murderous character of the East Anglian landscape is being kept alive by two of today's most successful crime writers. Um, yes, please. What's your name? Judy. Judy. So, with a Y. It's the Felix Stowe Book Festival, and a husband and wife crime writing team are here to talk about and sign their new book. The couple, who live in Suffolk, have co written more than 20 bestsellers under the pen name Nikki French. I think, I think Saturday is quite, there's a kind of darkness. You, know, you, feel, you have to feel the storm is gathering, really. One of the most successful books is Losing You. The story is set among an isolated community living on a fictional island called Sandling. In reality, it's actually Mersey Island off the Essex coast. Here on Sandling Island, it was all horizon. The level land, the mudflats, the miles of marshes, the saltings, the grey, wrinkled sea. The first book that we wrote that was based in Suffolk was before we actually moved here. And maybe was one of the reasons we came here, because we explored it for this book and got to know it, and then came here. But it's certainly true that there are certain books we've written which are so located in a particular environment, kind of the coastal Suffolk, the kind of mud flats and birds crying out and shingle and grey seas. And that, there are certain thrillers we write which need a kind of haunted empty landscape. I think there's something about living, looking out to sea rather than back inland. So people who kind of live looking away from where they're living, kind of people who live on the edge. And also it, it feels it's full of forgotten places. That, that feels quite a kind of fruitful area for crime fiction. And also, you know, the area in, the areas that we have placed books around here, it's not golden beaches and blue skies and tourists. It's like mm. the kind of, a lot of it's the kind of unpicturesque, the deserted. Bleak, desolate. Bleak, yeah, the yeah. wind blowing yeah. in. In the story, the Landry family are about to go on holiday when teenage daughter Charlie goes missing. Told over a period of just a day, it's about Mum Nina's frantic search to discover what's happened to her daughter. Once again, it's the edginess of this flat, watery landscape that creates tension. The last time I'd walked past the Hulks, it had been in early October. I remembered it clearly. The tide had been low then. The Hulks lay in a massed huddle on the mud. There'd been dozens of noisy, cheerful gulls perched on the smashed decks. Now, the tide was high, and vicious little waves riffled round the hulls. For ages, we had an idea of writing a book about a mother losing her daughter, the, a kind of basic story of a parent's worst nightmare, but we couldn't think of how to turn it into a really different kind of thriller until, actually, until we came to, came to Mersey Island. Well, yeah, I remember when we walked around here, it just felt just unbelievably perfect because it's this, it's this contained island which is part of Britain, but it's like cut off once a day, the, the, the tide comes over the causeway. And we set it on the shortest day of the shortest year. Shortest day of the year. So we had this sense that the tide was rising, the island was getting cut off, darkness was closing in and then we wrote a book that actually is in real time and that has no chapters either so it's this sense of absolute claustrophobia everything closing down and once we had all of that then we could write yeah then we I, could write a book and actually the, so the, it's the, the landscape made the thriller it was the also, landscape the tur that gave us the plot almost and when we saw these sort of whatever they are kind of hulks houseboats we knew they were going to play an important part in the story and we actually shifted them to another part of the island that's a little bit more desolate using our creative license <laughs> and we knew that that Nina our heroine was going to find something really nasty inside one of them I used to love Sandling Island at night the silence the slap and murmur of water the smell of salt and mud the chime of halyards and the forlorn cry of birds now it terrified me.
Throughout their book, the couple take inspiration from what they observed walking around Mersey Island. Sometimes the most unlikely things are used in a very dramatic way, as Mum Nina continues searching for her daughter. It was, I think it was about halfway through the book, we had this crucial scene at the beach hut. And what we, what we really wanted to do is we wanted to take the idea of Nina being full of in, rising wildness and breaking lots of boundaries. Mm -hmm. And so we took these rather pretty little domestic spaces in a public, on a public place and we have her smashing into them with a mallet. She does them one by one at night time, just going through splintering open the doors. One of the great things about writing a book rather than making a film is you can actually, you're free just to find this <laughs> lovely <laughs> landmark here and just smash them one after another, which I think would be, a, would be a bit of a problem if you were actually going to film it. But it was rather, it was rather satisfying as yeah. she broke taboo after taboo. Yeah. And there's this sense that, you know, behind these lovely little English doors, there might be a dead body or someone being kept, kept captive. Yes, yes. Something else the French spotted while exploring Mersey Island was this derelict Second World War observation post. It became the setting for the book's dramatic ending. The character Nina finally discovers what's happened to her kidnapped daughter. Um, I remember we actually came on this beach on the day where the story was set. Yeah, we, had this, we had this sense that if the, if the tide was rising and the island was getting cut off and time was running out, we had to end it at a place where it mattered that the tide was rising, where it was just kind of crucial that you know, every inch the water crept up was mm. an inch more dangerous. And also, there was, I think we all faced, one of the problems we faced is on a kind of really little island and someone has disappeared, where can you actually hide someone on a little island by the by the sea, on the beach. It may even have been this particular lump of concrete, which I think well, is the remains of, there of a There are pillboxes all the way well, around the island, so there was, we probably envisaged a more intact pillbox, but then placed it And that it seemed here. perfect, it's inside a pillbox, with the tide coming up, gradually filling with water. It just, that just felt like the kind of, and that was a, a total example, I think, of how the kind of story and place and character kind of play off each other. A boggy path that led to the treacherous marshes and borrow dikes. To the left, the road ran along the low subsiding cliffs, then turned inland again, away from the cliffs, the dikes, the land that slid and melted into silted mud and salty water, and back towards the causeway. For me, the power of all the stories we've explored is that they're rooted in real places. The most successful crime writers know how to use the extremes and play with the contrast between beauty and desolation to make it work for them. The land of East Anglia itself becomes a player in the drama. You've heard about our crime novels, but what are the books that you'd like to recommend? Do share your suggestions using the hashtag love to read and you can see what other books people are talking about.